my father, he, he rides a bus, so I've come up riding on the bus also. We have no buses out. That means people can't get anywhere. People wouldn't have transportation to go to whatever they need to be going. And uh, I think uh, the city couldn't uh, function without RTA. The Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority has been an important part of the Corpus Christi, Nueces County, and San Patricio County communities since 1986. But the history of public transportation in the Coastal Bend goes back much further than that. As the city continued to grow and expand its boundaries, it got too far to walk and having a horse was not all that convenient at times. So the public transportation truly did allow people to get around the city. Public transportation helped advance the economy of South Texas by helping employees get to their places of work, students to their classrooms, customers to their shopping destinations, and patients to their health care providers. Public transportation provides those without personal transportation the independence and freedom of being able to get where they want, when they want. The Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority, or CCRTA, has been operating the B since 1986, serving over 830 square miles of the coastal bend. All of these programs are helping to ensure a brighter, safer, cleaner, and more convenient tomorrow. While the CCRTA was established in 1986, Corpus Christi's history of public transportation goes back much further. It was not settled till about 1839 when Henry Kinney came here to set up a trading post and he set it up in Corpus Christi because there was no law here. He was planning on smuggling goods to Mexico. This area was claimed by the Republic of Texas and also by Mexico, so it was under control of neither. So he set up a trading post here and eventually a little settlement started to form around it. The U.S. Army came here in 1845 and stayed till March 1846. Then the town became deserted until after the Mexican War. About 1848, people started to come back. With its proximity to the border, Corpus Christi became a major hub in the trading routes between the U.S. and Mexico. Mexican and American ranchers were bringing in wool to be shipped out of Corpus Christi and through the to the markets in the U.S. and they were bringing them in in uh, oxen-drawn carts. The increase in traffic brought with it the need for more convenient and reliable transportation. In 1875, the Corpus Christi, San Diego, and Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railroad built a line from Corpus Christi to Rancho Banquete. When the line was sold and became the Texas Mexican Railway in 1881, it extended its line to Laredo. For the first time we were connected to the U.S. by rail and it still was not all that convenient. It was 13 hours to get to San Antonio by rail. The railway's depot was the starting point for the city's first public transportation system in the form of Herdies. The Herdies came along in the 1880s. A guy named Peter Herdick developed a transportation system with mule-drawn wagons. The carriages were capable of holding up to eight passengers and were small enough to maneuver through the streets and drop passengers off at the curb instead of the middle of the street. That became the first uh, transportation system privately owned, but uh, was there for a profit. In 1890, New Jersey developer Eliu Ropes established the Corpus Christi Improvement Company and built a steam dummy locomotive line guided by a system of tracks that ran from the courthouse down Chaparral and out what would become Santa Fe to the Alta Vista Hotel at Three Mile Point. That was the main street in, in Corpus Christi. And so all the trolleys went up and down Chaparral before they went out in other areas and it was not paved till 1914, so they actually laid these trolleys down the middle of the dirt street. The streets would turn into mud. I guess the trolley was still okay, but when you got off the trolley, you were stepping into uh, mud until they were paved, and those were under the road until, I think until they started redoing Chaparral for, for uh, this new redevelopment project they're doing. I think they probably dug them up then, but that, it was easier to just leave them buried than it was to, uh, to dig them up. This new trolley system that served the majority of the city was short-lived. There was a panic and they ran out of money. The hotel was never totally finished at that time, so it sort of just died. Uh, and I think the trolley system mostly died with it. While the steam trolleys were abandoned, the need for public transportation remained. And so the cars were con reconverted back into horse-drawn or mule-drawn cars, and uh, they became the, the, the transportation system in the, in the community. So they did not need tracks. Those were just sort of 
wagons or carriages that hold people around. In 1900, the public transportation system in Corpus Christi consisted of only one driver who serviced the entire town. One day that year, he mysteriously disappeared. That ended the system, and, and I, nobody knows what happened to him. He just got on a whim to leave, or else he fell off a bridge or something like that and disappeared. No one stepped forward to take his place, so the city went without public transportation for the next 10 years. One of the things that happened in 1905 was uh, Epworth by the Sea came in. It was a Methodist youth encampment on North Beach at the north end of North Beach. And they would bring 10,000 people during the summer to Corpus Christi for revival meetings and youth workshops and so forth. And this is when the population of the city was 5,000. So it brought a tremendous amount of people. The increase in population, due both to business improvements as well as Corpus Christi becoming a vacation destination, led to the push to strengthen the city's infrastructure. Between 1912 and 1916, there were a tremendous amount of civic improvements to the city. We put in a water system, we paved the streets, we built a municipal pier, uh, they built the causeway across the bay, the county did that, they built the new 1914 courthouse. There was a tremendous amount of civic improvement going on in that period of time. A Philadelphia firm bought the railway in 1914 and established the Corpus Christi Railway and Light Company. Uh, in 1916, an army camp was built here. Uh, there were Mexican border raids uh, during the Mexican Revolution, and uh, the U.S. Army stationed a bunch of troops along the, uh, the border. And uh, after the 1916 hurricane flooded out some of those camps, about 3,500 soldiers were brought to Corpus Christi into a camp called Camp Scurry, which was built between 3rd Street and just beyond Louisiana. So the trolley system was expanded into the camp as part of the deal so the soldiers would actually have uh, transportation into town. They added more lines and 10 more trolleys and ran the company until 1919 when a hurricane destroyed the system along with most of Corpus Christi. In the morning of the hurricane they said about 9 o'clock they put out a, that the storm was coming and the, the trolley system started running all their cars up and down North Beach bringing people off the low-lying areas. These trolleys saved countless lives by moving people out of harm's way. While the hurricane devastated the city and the trolley lines, it wasn't the end of public transportation in Corpus Christi. They got the trolley system back up and operating in about two months. And North Beach was the first suburbia. Before the 1919 hurricane, there were about 250 houses on North Beach. Those people all probably came into town for uh, their business and their pleasure. It was all residential at the time, so they would be using the public transportation to come in. As the population of Corpus Christi and the surrounding areas grew, including the new suburban area of North Beach, the need for public transportation increased. That need for public transportation was about to grow even more. When the hurricane of 1919 destroyed the original port on Harbor Island, a search for the new port began. The Corps of Engineers said we're not going to put another uh, port out on the Harbor Island or Port Aransas or someplace like that, so Corpus Christi was eventually chosen to be the, the port and then growth took off. And we continued to double our population every 10 years all the way through 1970. As the personal automobile became more popular, ridership on the system fell. When the Central Power and Light Company introduced the first buses in 1925, the trolleys fell out of popularity and disappeared by the 1930s. The company was soon sold and renamed the Nueces Transportation Company. The company increased the number of buses operating in the city from just 13 in 1931 to over 100 in 1945. Due to restrictions and rationing caused by World War II, ridership of the bus system climbed to more than 18 million a year. After World War II, we saw a tremendous amount of growth in the country and in the transportation systems and uh, people started, autos, autos got relatively inexpensive by that period of time. So people were buying cars, many people buying their first ones, and so they weren't needing public transportation nearly as much. By the early 1960s, ridership had returned to the lower numbers, averaging only about three million per year. The decrease in ridership made the bus system a financial liability for the Nueces Transportation Company. So in 1966, the company and its 45 buses were sold to the city of Corpus Christi. When 
the city owned the public transportation, they, they again ran into budget constraints. And so the city did not put a lot of money in expanding the bus system either. At the time, Corpus Christi had a bus operation that was really confined to inside Padre Allen Drive. It was the old core of the city. The city was just maintaining the status quo. By the mid-1980s, Corpus Christi had grown more than 200% since the system had been sold to the city. But the NTC was now only running 35 buses, and the system was quickly losing the money it needed to operate safely and efficiently. The Chamber of Commerce created a committee to study transit. They came up with the finding that it was a good idea to look at a self-sufficient transit organization. So in June of 1984, the city of Corpus Christi actually created the RTA. In the summer of 1985, the citizens of Corpus Christi voted and approved a half-cent sales tax to fund the CCRTA. It went from a $3 million operation to a $15 million operation. In January of 1986, the CCRTA took over the maintenance and operation of the Corpus Christi transit system. The, the city had some of the oldest equipment and most depressing bus stops and facilities, and so some of that money had to go into replacing buses and then creating some bus facilities that were uh, helpful for passengers. The Six Point Station was the only thing that existed, and it was just that little traffic triangle with a shelter on it. They created one at the Port Ayers Y, and, uh, and upgraded facilities around, you know, and, and tried to expand the bus routes to go beyond South Padre Island Drive. The CCRTA's first year established routes to the Naval Air Station, as well as Gregory and Robstown. It also investigated the possibility of a ferry system, but eventually abandoned the idea and decided to focus on larger programs like expanding its fixed route services, creating park and ride lots, and making the transit system more accessible to those with disabilities. It's probably a major shift after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed to uh, really expand the paratransit operation. They called it CARE-V at the time, it's now the V-Line. That really wouldn't have happened without the RTA being an independent, self-sufficient uh, organization. Today, the CCRTA has over 300 employees, 86 fixed route buses, the Harbor Ferry, and the Paratransit B-Line for those ADA-eligible riders. Public transportation in South Texas has come a long way since the mule-drawn carriages of more than 100 years ago. It will be another exciting 100 years as public transportation continues to grow and evolve and improve the lifestyles and standard of living for all the residents of Nueces and San Patricio counties.